It is my pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, I just have to say at the risk of sounding like a mutual admiration society, I still have to say some of the things about my appreciation for James and Linda and Josh and Hannah. Um, I was a fixture at their house. Our two houses were very close walking distance. And so James said you might find it hard to believe he was in shape to play tennis. Well, come look at me, right? <laughs> But we, we did, um, and have, I have the, just the greatest appreciation uh, for the relationship we've had over the years with the Henry family. And, um, you know, my standard joke when I go and preach at churches where I know the colleagues is to say, if you write me a large enough check, I'll tell you the stories. <laughs> but that doesn't work with James and Linda for a number of reasons. It doesn't work because I know James has already told you the stories. <laughs> and I know that if James ever sort of got full of himself, Linda's already told you the stories. <laughs> and I know if James and Linda haven't told you the stories, Josh or Hannah <laughs> would have already told you the stories. So let's cut the middle thing out and just write a check to missions, and then I'll still tell you some stories. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you. As James said, the title is Director of Connectional Ministries. And so when I say that title in most places, the eyes just glaze over because most folks just don't really know what that means. And so the real simple secular equivalent is that I'm the chief of staff for the bishop of the Virginia Conference. And I manage programs and money and so on and so forth. Um, but most of all, I'm really excited about this time of being with you all. And again, a word of appreciation to James for this opportunity. A uh, word of appreciation to the praise band. You, you folks are smooth. <laughs> Do you, you see those and hear those transitions? Smooth. You don't get that everywhere. My appreciation to you all for coming out this morning. I never take it for granted that people choose to come and be in worship. I know for a fact you could have chosen to be somewhere else this morning. So I appreciate that you are here this morning. And for this morning, I've got this title called An Opportune Moment based on the scripture that is in Luke 21, 5 through 19. It's a bit of a long scripture, but it's got some great stuff in it. And it has stuff that goes deeper than the surface level. So let me read that for you. Luke 21, 5 through 19. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he. And the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes and famines and pestilence in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors and on all on my account and in my name. So you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents, brothers, sisters, relatives, and friends. 
And they will put some of you to death, for everyone will hate you because of me. But not a hair on your head will perish. And this is our key verse, folks. Stand firm, and you will win life. I really did some praying when I knew that I would have this opportunity to be with you. And I did some thinking, and I did some pondering, and I started looking at and reading and paying closer attention to some of the news. And I started paying closer attention to some of the national events in the U.S. And, of course, you can't get away from some of the challenges that are going on in the United Methodist Church right now. You can't get away from it. If you have, just give somebody else a hug. <laughs> And so in all these things and all these challenges, it just seemed to me that while Luke 21, 5 to 19 is a bit of a long verse, the stuff that's going on in Luke 19, in Luke 21, 5 to 19 is so amazingly relevant for today because when you look behind these verses and the actual words, what the scholars and the commentaries tell us is that there are four different things going on. In Luke 21, 5 to 19, four different things. First, there's this thing going on where the background is an understanding in Jewish understanding and belief that, that there's this present age in which bad things are going to happen. So that's one piece. And so that's the piece where you hear this beautiful temple will be torn down. It's a part of Jewish folklore. There's this thing going on where there's a prophecy about Jerusalem falling and Roman armies coming, marching in. Another part of this thing of, of the terrible things that could happen. That belief was that there would be 1.1 million people who would be lost. There's this other thing going on in Luke 21 about the second coming of Christ and how you're going to know when Christ comes. And the last thing going on is the persecution and how Christians are encouraged to face the persecution. But those last words, stand firm. So I want to start by telling you a true story on the stand firm front. This really happened. This is a guy, it's about a guy who's a United Methodist, and the roles that he plays and the ways he engages life. He's a United Methodist, he's a small church lay leader, meaning he has leadership in the church, he is active in the community, um, the job he gets paid for is to be an airline pilot for United. So his name is Brad, and, and after one conversation and on one of his flights, Brad said, I got to tell you what happened, got to tell you what happened, Ted. He said, this flight, one of my flights was supposed to take off. And the folks who work on the plane came to me and said, Brad, pilot Brad, we can't take off. We can't move. We can't do anything. There's a woman who has thrown herself down at the entry to the plane. She is sobbing and frightened, and she will not move. She is terrified that the plane is going to crash. So she's at the door of the plane. And you all understand very clearly, I think, in this day and age of airline flights and security and so forth, the normal thing would be that they would just, you'd get a video of it, they'd call the police, the folks would come, <laughs> and they would drag her off. But that's not what Brad wanted. Brad wanted to have a different kind of resolution. Brad says that he went to the woman and he knelt down and he looked over her and said, so you're afraid. And she said, I'm deathly afraid. And Brad said he leaned in closer and he said, do you see what I'm wearing? And the woman said, yes, I see your uniform. He said, no, look closer. Do you see what I'm wearing? And she looked at him closer and she saw that he had a cross around his neck. And she said, I see your cross. Are you a Christian? He said, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this. None of my planes leave the ground without prayer, deep prayer. 
none of my planes leave the ground without me asking the Lord to do everything God can and everything Jesus can to, to override any deficiencies of the pilots. This plane that you're about to get on has already been bathed in prayer, Brad told her. And he said, so you're a Christian as well, yes? And she said, yes. And he said, do you go to any faith community? Do you go to any church? She said, yes. And he said, I don't know what they preach at your church. And I don't know what they teach at your church. But at my church, they teach, stand firm in Christ. Especially when in doubt, stand firm in Christ. Can I help you up? Can I help you to your seat? Can we sit down? Let's even do a prayer at your seat. You can pray for this plane and for everybody who's leading it. And that's just, and she got up. It was like one of those biblical Jesus things, get up and walk. <laughs> And she got up and she went to her seat. It was that stand firm message that helped her. I think it's the stand firm message that we still need today. And I'd say we need it and I'd say why we need it in this way. As much as I want to be informed and as much as I want to use cyber tools, I'm really becoming sick of all the hate that's flying around, I'm really becoming disturbed by the disconnect. It was already tough enough to, to stay really connected with people in the cyber world, but, but it's sort of like it's so toxic sometimes. It's, folks, am I the only one that's sick of some of this? Just say, help us, Jesus, if, you're, if you've had enough of it. But I want to be engaged. I want to be informed. But I don't want to say some whatever comment and then get hit by a barrage of cyber hate. But that's the environment we have, folks. I have to tell you, a few months ago, I heard this from some leaders of political parties. They said, in a confession style, that they figured out as long as they can keep people separated... They can control the narrative. Now, we were living that before they ever said it. Yes? <laughs> That's no surprise. That's not news. We're living in a time and an environment and in a troubling space in the United Methodist Church where people are also just becoming separated from one another. And I will never be convinced that this is God's will. I will never be convinced that Christ formed and shaped the church for any faith community to say we're better off separate. We're better off disconnected. I do not believe it. You can't convince me. What you can convince me of is that when Luke 21, 5 through 19, talks about these different four dynamics, of this beautiful thing that's torn down. That imagery strikes me in the nation and the church. And it gets my attention. When this Luke 21 talks about the prophecy of armies marching in and, and, and people just being destroyed. Uh, human life being destroyed. We're seeing it. When I look at Luke 21 and I see this piece of the question... When will Jesus come? Or even a related question. How will we know great leaders and leaders of integrity and leaders of truth from leaders who have different personal agendas that are not meant to build up? How do we know? Well, I love Jesus' answer. Stand firm in me and you will win life. How do we know? Because those who really, really are a part of being led by Christ are going to first be demonstrating love and grace and charity and selflessness. Listen, folks, you're not going to find Jesus and narcissism in the same space. Give me at least one amen on that. 
You're not going to find that. You're not going to find narcissism and Jesus in the same space. You're going to find those in totally different kinds of spaces. But what you will find are the narcissist trying to creep into every kind of space. It's just the nature of narcissism. When I look at Luke 21, 5 to 19, and I hear about the prosecution, the persecution, the harm, and the terrible things, I think there are moments when we've drifted into it as a society, and I know we need a counterbalance. I call this sermon an opportune time, an opportune moment. Opportune because, St. James, we are living in an opportune moment where people of faith, probably in every turn, are given a chance, one, to stand firm. Where we're given an opportunity, one, to recognize the difference and the distinction between destruction and the building up. We're living in an opportune moment where, think of it this way. When you leave to church today, you leave this space, it is possible you will have an opportune moment to decide what will influence you in behavior, thought, and deed. You will have an opportune moment. And the question could come very quickly. Will you stand firm in your core values Influenced by Jesus Christ, or will you fall prey to that which is a weaker self? That which may not be the determination to remember your core values, to remember your faith. Those moments come, they even come as a surprise. They even come when unexpected. Let me confess it in this way. A few weeks ago, I was required and needed to go to a training event. I didn't want to go. <laughs> I just didn't want to go. I didn't want to be there. But I had to go, so I went. I was in a crowded lobby with lots of folks I didn't know. I stood in an elevator, waiting for the elevator to open. And there were two women there I'd never met before. They took advantage of an opportune moment, not even knowing it. In our conference, we refer to these as glory sightings because something happens that has to be a holy moment. Nevertheless, we're standing there at the elevator waiting for it to open. These women I've never met before, they look at me. I don't know if they saw sourpuss or if they saw something else. But they look at me and they say, you're one of those Methodists. <laughs> you look like a Methodist. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know what a Methodist looks like, but clearly it looks like me. <laughs> and they say, we just want to say this to you. We know that the United Methodist Church is going through a difficult time but we appreciate you. You Methodists do good work. You Methodists care about people. And we want to thank you. And then the conversation shifts, because I don't, I don't have any words. <laughs> From the point of you look like a Methodist, I had nothing to say. <laughs> they said, you need a hug. <laughs> now, after this event, was finished, I texted my daughter Helen and said, these two women, they just hugged me. <laughs> and Helen said, you letting strange women hug you now? <laughs> I said, yeah, there are rare exceptions. They said, you look like you need a hug. You do need a hug. We're going to give you a hug. In this context of Luke 21, and these very, very challenging things that are going on. 
And in this context of the U.S. nation, especially the worst influences of the political world, in this context of the United Methodist Church, in the context of life, because as if life wasn't hard enough already, we got all these things swirling around making it more challenging. In those contexts, I just felt like we ought to hear a word of hope that says, hey folks, and it's similar to what we see in scripture, in the world you will have tribulation. That's what Jesus says. In this world you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. I really, really love what James 3.17 says. Uh, every time I do that, I say, James, well, not that James, <laughs> the other James. James 3.17, I've not come to condemn the world, but to save it. That's what it says. And folks, you know why that means so much to me? Because I don't think I could count the number of times when I have felt condemned. It still happens in different places at different times, just feeling condemned. And so it's hopeful for me to hear a message that counterbalances what I'm seeing and experiencing in the challenging things in the world. And it's helpful for me to be able to hear, Ted, stand firm, stand firm. Uh, it's uh, found out this morning, now you all have what, five, six, seven Jameses here? <laughs> You got the James glove? So I can easily say, James, stand firm. <laughs> you have some other folks who share the same name. What was the other one, James, of multiples here? Mark. Mark. <laughs> stand firm. <laughs> What's the other one? I know you got more. Than, you got Linda's. Linda's, stand firm. Because in the world you will have tribulation, but I've overcome the world. Stand firm, because these things are going to happen. Life's going to remain hard. But stand firm. Hold to your core values. Hold on to one another. Use the strength of this St. James community to hold to one another and to firm and to love and to give grace to one another. Couldn't say it any better than the way Jesus said it, folks at St. James. And folks who are watching us, stand firm in Jesus' name.